very excited about tonight's event. I'm Andrea Packard. I'm the List Gallery Director and had the great pleasure and honor of curating the current exhibition in the List Gallery, Lois Dodd, Windows and Reflections. And I'm very delighted to also introduce our distinguished guests tonight, uh, Faye Hirsch and Lois Dodd. But before I do that, I just want to thank a few people who helped make this event possible, both the talk and the exhibit, and the accompanying catalog. And everyone here tonight would uh, may take a free catalog uh, while supplies last. Uh, it's, uh, all these events are thanks to the Donald J. Gordon Fund, and we're very grateful to the Gordon family for supporting such endeavors, such an ambitious shows. We're also delighted that we could have Barry Schwabsky write an essay for this catalog. Um, he couldn't be with us tonight, but he provided a really interesting um, essay. And uh, in it, he, he says, it's really becoming increasingly obvious that Lois Dodd is one of the most important painters of the past half century or so. And I think many of us here who know her and know her work would agree wholeheartedly. I also want to thank the Department of Art and my colleague Betsy Hinsey, who always does so much for the gallery, and my interns, uh, Blake Oding and Tess, I don't see you. I think they're still outside uh, preparing the reception for afterwards, so please uh, stay and enjoy the refreshments. Um, and Yixuan Luo, Luo um, also helped install the show, so there you are. <laughs> thank you. Um, and now I want to introduce Faye Hirsch, who um, we're delighted to have join us uh, because she too is immersed in all things Lois. And uh, she received her PhD in art history from Yale University um, in 1987. And uh, she's taught at many institutions, including the U University of Oregon at Eugene, uh, the University of Arizona at Tucson, the School of Visual Arts in New York, and the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, currently, she's visiting associate professor and MFA coordinator of the Program of Art and Design at SUNY Purchase. And she was a uh, senior editor at um, Art in America for a number of years, from 2003 to 2013. And she's now a contributing editor there. Prior to that, she was chief editor at Art on Paper and also senior editor at the Prince Center Collector's Newsletter. But her main focus now is her forthcoming monograph on none, none other than Lois Dodd. And uh, we're very excited. It's going to be published by Lund Humphreys in a part of a series of, of monographs on very important artists. Um, actually, it's being edited, I believe, by Barry Sch Schwabsky. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So we're really delighted to have Faye here share her insights and expertise. So please join me in welcoming Faye. And now on to our most distinguished visiting artist, Lois Dodd, the 2016 Donald J. Gordon visiting artist. Um, and I'm just going to take one minute and welcome our friends from Alexander Gallery, um, who were very helpful as I was curating the exhibit and uh, Phil Alexander and Marie Evans. Uh, they helped me identify available works and facilitate the loan of them to the show uh, so that our little gallery has a monumentality I've never seen before. So thank you so much for your help. You're uh, such, so great to work with. So but back to Lois. Um, as many of you know, she was born in 1927 in Montclair, New Jersey. And uh, she spent three years at Cooper Union, the distinguished art school in New York City, uh, where you get in, it's a free scholarship, where um, there she met some important friends and um, her future husband, Bill King, uh, friends Alex Katz. She went up to Maine with them, where they were studying at Skowhegan, fell in love with Maine, uh, went to Italy with them, and when she came back in 1952, there's Lois in her studio in Maine. It's 
Psalm 52. Not that one. <laughs> Thank you. Please jump in at any point. And I should add, I'm just going to speak for a few more minutes, give you a little bit of an interview about her distinguished career, and a little, just a few words about the current show. And then my, my plan is to allow Faye to share with you some of her insights. And we're both going to pose, please come in, feel free. It's all very informal. Um, uh, we want to uh, pose some questions to Lois and give you a chance to talk. <laughs> and then we really would love it if the audience would share some of their questions and observations, because I notice many distinguished artists in the audience as well. Um, so um, anyway, back to 19... Uh, 52, um, you were one of the founding artists at Tanager Gallery, and there you are with Irving Sandler in the gallery, and you're organizing the space, and on the right is a scene of the gallery from the outside on an opening night, perhaps, and it was one of the first galleries on 10th Street, what was the rent, $40 a week? Right, and rents are now about seventy thousand, sort of forty dollars a month, right? Forty dollars a month. Yeah, and now it's about seventy thousand um, for a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so with fellow artists, um, it's a real estate office now. A real estate office. You had a reunion recently, right? How poetic. Yeah, it's, it's got a fancy balustrade, and it's it's just another world. Yeah. The whole and when you started, you were starting with Bill King and Charles Kajori and right. others. George Mitchell. Yeah, George Mitchell. And Angela. Fred Mitchell, sorry. Angela was very important because he's the one that had the sense of the space and how to, how to fix the walls and the ceiling and make it into a, a good exhibition space. So and everybody recognized that this was the catalyst for along with the cedar bar is also sometimes mentioned but um and the fact that de kooning had a studio nearby but but this is started was part of a number of co-ops that really energized the area and although there weren't many sales i believe you said it was sort of your mfa the only sale was leonard anderson <laughs> <laughs> whose daughter is right here. I <laughs> delivered the painting to the, bought by another painter. Can I just tell yeah. a quick little anecdote just, about it? was John Cope. I, um, I, I've been doing a lot of research, and I was in the Archives of American Art, and I found this review of um, the, ten, it was a, somebody was wandering around the 10th Street co-ops, and they went into, they went into Tanager, and they said, uh, and there was a, you know, these are these real sort of makeshift galleries, and there was a young girl and a young woman, and not even, they didn't say woman, they said a girl, yeah. I think, sitting at the desk, yeah. right, <laughs> <laughs> with, with a baby pink, with a baby playing on the floor. And we figured out it was probably Eli, <laughs> um, who I haven't met yet, but yeah, and, and, uh, and, and just the idea of just dismissive, you know, and there was Lois, yeah. the only woman, right? Yeah. And, and as he you was, can see in the picture, he was a terrible reviewer. I mean, he was yeah. a nasty man. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to get him fired from the Times by writing letters to tell him, you know, that we didn't like his attitude about covering art on the Street. But of course, that just put him in more solid. They loved that they were getting angry letters from people on 10th Street. So he, you know, we, we said nothing about that. And finally, he became the food, uh, re, what do we call it, the person who, who talks about food on the Times. Lois, <laughs> 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 so I, I don't know if you can see what's on the screen from where you are, but there yeah. you are in the lower left corner here yeah. of this picture, mostly male artists. Um, and and despite those here. inauspicious beginnings, when it was during the heyday of abstract expressionism and Lois was forging bonds with so many other people working figuratively, she did go on to uh, create artwork that has been collected by distinguished institutions. Um, and not to digress too much onto your credentials, which I know you prefer to be modest about, but your work is held in the collections of the Tucson Museum of Art, the Bronx Museum of Art, the Queen's Museum of Art. I'll skip over the, the lengthy list, um, but also would like to mention that 
you went on to teach at many distinguished institutions as well, um, including Vermont Studio Center, uh, the Skowhegan School of uh, Painting and Sculpture, and at Brooklyn College, where you taught for more than 20 years, from 1971 to 92. And some of your for former students are here today, and um, and I, I and representatives of the uh, or a representative of the Academy of Arts and Letters, of which you're an elected member. Um, you're an elected member of the National Academy of Design, and the recipient of many awards. And I'll just name two: um, the Benjamin Wa uh, West Kleindienst Medal and Fellowship from the National Academy and a grant from the Ingram Merrill Foundation um, and the government of Italy. So your works in the Whitney, in the National Academy of Design, Cooper Hume Hewitt National Design Museum, and yet you've maintained a great uh, modest attitude, a non-hierarchical demeanor that has engaged you with such a broad community from contemporaries such as Alex Katz, Philip Perlstein, Leonard Anderson, um, and also many younger artists who benefited from your generosity. I think many of us are honored that you're here today because we admire the authenticity of your vision. You've never pandered to art trends, and you've been so generous as a colleague and teacher. And equally, you in your painting have been able to distill such complexity in the landscape and in the world into such compelling and enduring images. And so that is why you are considered a painter's painter, um, because you elaborate the traditions of, the story traditions of painting, but you really make them your own. And this painting here from the exhibit is an embodiment of that. And also another uh, painting, which I don't know if you can see here, Natural Order, I put up here as an example of one of the works that relate to the traditions of painting we're so familiar with, the work of Cezanne and others. But it's not one-dimensional in that way. Um, we're so pleased to see the variety of your affinities, including your sense of uh, place, pragmatism, and pattern that we see in such great artists as Arthur Dove, or another main artist, Marsden Hartley, or another painter of urban scenes and somewhat dilapidated, dilapidated places or lonely places, Edward Hopper. And like Hopper, I see that you draw our attention to ordinary homes and spaces, finding uh, poetry and ge geometric order and harmonic proportion, and yet also expressing a profound empathy for the places and the people who inhabit them. So to conclude my little overview of your show, um, we're thrilled to host examples of one of your primary areas of interest, windows and reflections. Um, and the 19 works in the show, uh, we're fortunate, feature this uh, particular painting from 1968, Upstairs Window, which we understand to be one of your first paintings of windows in which the window really nearly aligns with the picture support mm -hmm. which, with the panel. So you've painted diverse subjects and places, which uh, Faye's going to talk about, but windows have been an ongoing interest for more than 50 years. And so we are interested to see how it's been variously interpreted by you, somewhat formally like this, but also in other ways that reduce unnecessary clutter. So um, just to quickly show a couple of the varieties of painting. Um, here, you know, the painting on the left by you, um, barn window with white square, to my mind, really calls, recalls the work of Mondrian and his abstract cribs. Mm -hmm. And others have pointed out that it also relates to artists such as Kazmir Malevich. Um, but if you look closely at such images, you see your interest with trompe l'oeil painting and uh, which of course brings to mind the great American tradition such as you see out here on the right, this detail of a painting by William Harnett. Um, and other works such as this staircase with window, which is in the show, bring to mind the great Charles Wilson 
Peel masterpiece, which is in the PMA, which shows his two sons going to the upstairs studio and actually includes a little step that protrudes out into the gallery. But your work uh, is more straightforward, a little less into magic tricks and more unassuming in some ways. Other works are more tremulous and expressive. And some pictures are a little brighter in mood. I was lying on the floor. That's why there's only the sky. This one? <laughs> I, mean, I noticed when I was lying on the floor that all you see is the sky. Oh, gee, that's, that's interesting. Do you want to say more about this? Well, that's that's yeah. about it. <laughs> there's nothing out there because I was down on the floor looking up. Yeah, and I thought, oh, all right. It's another, another window view, because I was were, really into windows, whatever year that was. If you're down on the floor looking up, how did you paint it? Oh, I was. I didn't paint it. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a big painting. Yeah, I so, know. No, but I this mean, is about I then five got feet the tall. idea, so I, I really had to concentrate on the woodwork, right? The sky was going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, we just basically filled that sky in from memory afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just thought, gee, there. I'm, I'm looking at all these views, but here's this other view that's out a window, too. But you're always it so insistent. It hadn't occurred to me, unless I was on, it didn't occur to me to, except there it was on the floor, and that's what I saw. You're always very insistent that you're painting what you see. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a little bit stretched sometimes, because you were actually remembering that. You oh, no, no, but it's what I saw. You saw it. <laughs> but I mean, none of those big ones. I wasn't any of those big window paintings. Uh, well, we have to look at them. Well, we I, I, I wasn't set up right in front of them. Usually there's a smaller right. version. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit yeah, about that, yeah. actually. Because right. um, you work, this show has both the, it's a really nice combination of the masonite, yeah. the small masonite paintings, right. and then the larger. Right oil on linen, so I was wondering if you could... But none of them are the same subject in the show. Right, exactly, yeah, but there are there, some. There are. Yeah, there yeah. are some where you get yeah. both subjects, but right. I'm wondering if you could tell people how you work. I mean, how, what do you do on masonite and when? And yeah, I've, I've got masonite, which is portable, so you can go anywhere and set up and paint conveniently, uh, which I do mostly. I mean, there, there, there must be 20 masonite panels for every stretched canvas that I do. And uh, later on, when I'm looking through them, I, I just have a feeling about some of them that this would be more interesting if it were larger. So I'll make another second version. And that's how the big ones generally come about, except for paintings that I did in the woods because I tried to do them on little panels but you're standing in this surrounded so you, you can't you can't I, it was physically impossible to gather up the woods and get it in front of me so but I could somehow I could get it on a larger linen canvas so that's how those came about uh, it's like a physical thing. You, you can do one thing and you can't do the other. But uh, And then there's see. the third kind of thing, which is your, well, there are also plywood panels, but you also use the little step flashings that you get right, in the hardware the store. Moon. Yeah. And those are even more portable. Very portable, yeah. This looks like a small um, it's <coughs> piece on Mason, and yeah. in contrast, yeah. there's a very large 84-inch wide piece yeah, that's that in the show. Linen. Yeah. And right. in this one, of course, you're zooming back from the idea of the window. And yeah, that, there's no window involved, really, except that there has to be, there is one in the, in the building. It becomes more of a motif the shed. than but a central uh, focus. I'm trying to think if I even did a small version of that. I can't remember. Yeah. I must have. So sometimes your windows are... Yeah something that we see through completely transparently, we're not aware of it at all as a window. Other times we 
you're really bringing our awareness. And that was in 1968, mm -hmm. the first time you did a self-sufficient window as a subject in itself. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then sometimes we're very aware of everything of the view through it, yeah. or very example. Of yeah, and this one is so complicated in terms of mm -hmm. what we're seeing. Can you explain this what it one? Is? This was I was actually set up. Right now, I did it out, outside by the window. <clears throat> it was a, a small building across the road from my house in, a, in the woods, and I saw the window, and I saw that there was another window, and I'd been doing windows right along, but this was really exciting, because it, for one thing, it reflected the stuff behind me on the one hand, and on the other, you're looking through the window that's across the darkened building, and you're seeing out the other side. So it was really exciting. And I wanted to make it window size, so I stretched up a canvas that size, set up over in the woods, and I guess it took about a week maybe. But I'd leave the canvas over there, tied to a tree, which is what I, my easel was usually a tree. And then uh, covered up with a big piece of plastic at night so that if it rained, it wouldn't get wet. Because I didn't know, it was kind of too big to be toting back and forth. And that's the way that one got done. And, and a number of the ones that were done in the woods came out of that kind of a process. I, carry them across the street, tie them up to a tree, and uh, take a few days. And of course, one of the things that draws artists to win painting windows, I think, is yeah. that they give you a chance to put a picture within a picture. Right. Uh, whether you're Vermeer, showing us an interior and yeah. an implied exterior, or here you have each pane of glass yeah, it's like a is four, another four world. Paintings. Yeah. yeah four opportunities. <laughs> and then the window itself is a world unto itself. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the really striking things, and you know, I, I've been studying this work, but through reproduction, so to see that actual paintings really is a huge uh -huh. difference. But, uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. but one of the things I was struck with in that show is, and you can see it here as well, is that um, you get the sense of, of you know, they're, they're empty of people. There's not a single soul represented right. in, in those yeah. paintings in there, and that's, it's very rare. We have one image here that has a figure in it, as we'll talk about, but mainly they're completely empty of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the, the human presence we feel very much is you, mm -hmm. a kind of consciousness, a, a kind of a consciousness and the sort of attentiveness to something that you're noticing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very, very subtle presence. So there's always the human in it, but it's not a human of depiction. Mm -hmm. It's more like sensibility, almost. Yo, know, that sounds great. No, but yeah. You know, I guess I've never been a figure painter to begin with, really. Well, we're going to see some. Yeah. 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 Um, but what you were saying, was, Andrea, about the different yeah. well, the I was paintings just, within painting. One thing that I admire about you, and I, I've heard you say you admire about other artists, is. Yeah. The, the ability to be multilingual with your languages of painting. And I think this painting here shows a lot of different ways of using the stroke. So you have such a linear approach, almost trompe l'oeil, with the window frame. Yeah. But then you have a more Stuff kind of window. Yeah. S somewhat representational lower left corner where we kind of look into the distance, more traditional. And then the other paints are more gestural and even approaching patterned. Mm -hmm. approach. And mm -hmm. so that's like several different languages happening all at the same time in a wonderful way. And um, you've also mentioned that you like the way Piet Mondrian um, had explored that range from a representational approach to the tree here on the left. And this year from 1908. And then he continued kind of the way you do with windows. Um, mm -hmm. Abstracting, you mentioned this to me, and I wondered, so I thought I'd put it up and just ask you, can you tell us a little bit about what you admire about Mondrian, particularly the early works such as these? Oh, well, I guess I admire the early work because it's landscape and because I like to work with landscape. Uh, and they're just 
always beautiful and terrific, and I still enjoy them as much as I ever did. He doesn't run out on me. But maybe I just don't, I don't advance to the pure abstraction as much. So I'm still attracted to these early Mondrians because of the... What, what do you think you would lose if you quote unquote advanced? What, to, what do I think I would lose? What would you lose if you, if you went too abstract? If and, I went too abstract? Yeah, what would happen? I wouldn't lose anything, but I just don't seem to be able to, to do that. I mean, to me it's totally abstract anyway. What I'm doing is totally abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am inspired by stuff that I find out in nature. Mm -hmm. I can't make it up. I think if you're going to be truly abstract, you have to have the ability to sit there with a blank canvas and invent the world. Can't do that. And so you've provided yourself with places to very closely and repeatedly observe right. scenes over many years, including yeah. uh, I have here a picture of you painting in the garden in Maine. I believe it's Leslie Land. It's Leslie's garden, garden. yeah. And so that sense of place, I love the quote I put up there, I don't know if you can see it. Painters are lucky because they actually seem to see things. Not everybody seems to see the world that they're living in. It's just such a kick, really, seeing things. And I think artists of, of share that desire to really slow down and, and right. take right. new information from the world. Can you talk a little bit about how being out in nature kicks that off for you? to be in the seeing mode rather than the yeah, preconceived? <laughs> any preconceived ideas you have, uh, I was telling it to the students, it's just not true if you're really out there looking at stuff. It can be bizarre, it can be just beautiful beyond what you could imagine. It can be, the color can be startling, the shapes can be unusual. The whole thing is just always a surprise. There's nothing old about it. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing that you can take for granted, really, about out, out of doors, it seems to me. And then, you know, the fact that everything is changing, constantly changing while you're looking at it, just adds to the excitement. And, and, uh, you didn't but, start as a plein air painter. You started no, I didn't. at I, all. I used drawings. Mm -hmm. I did draw outside, but I didn't paint outside. And uh, I, I think Alex is an example. He always went out and painted outside. Alex so Katz. after a while, I, I thought, gee, you know, I can try that. But I didn't, I didn't do that when I was sharing the place with he and, and Jean and then he and Ada at Lincolnville. It was when I moved to Cushing. Okay, I'll try what Alex says. <laughs> so yeah, different sorry. places in Maine that yeah. you've lived and worked. Right. So you, so. Um, when you first, do you remember the first time you started the first Yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. It was like, you can't, you can't see what's out there on there. The thing you just did in no way resembles what you see. Terrible, terrible <laughs> sensation. But then I took the thing, I did it a few times, and then I would take them away from what I was looking at, go in the barn with it, and look at it there. And when I looked at it there, oh yeah, it's a painting. It looks okay, it looks like a painting. So then I continued, but at first it was really upsetting. Well, it was, I, I, I was just teaching my own students, we yeah. were reading something by Gombrich, he yeah. talks about how, in representational painting, how when you're painting nature, it's just there's everything out there, and and the painter is always involved in distilling, and and, and, and abstracting, and yeah, yeah and making choices about mm -hmm. what's going to be in there. Mm -hmm. So, so is this a good time for you to talk about? Yeah, I just, stuff? I just, um, I mean, I love just you know going back and forth like yeah. this, but yeah. we we didn't know how much to prepare, but. One of the things that people should know about Lois, I think, is that you you work in, in very specific places. Um, you, I mean, most of your career, there's been some exceptions, but for the most part, you have your summers in Maine, 
your winters in New York and in the, on the weekends in New Jersey and Blairsville. Right. Right. And you know, if you start going over all your paintings, it's clear. You know, when there's a summer scene, it's likely Maine, with right. some exceptions. Yeah. The snowy winter scenes are, are Blairsville, maybe town. maybe Blairstown, and maybe the maybe also uh, New York to a certain extent. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, and so it's it, it it becomes this kind of wonderful seasonal thing and I think the sense of time in your work is partly is partly to be connected to that the idea of the passing seasons and the passing years but we wanted to show quickly because you you you're not a person who has a flashy life um, you know it's not like we can talk about a biography that is you know filled with hijinks and um, <laughs> there's a there's a real regularity to it. I mean, you, you lived for pain. You you worked all the time. So I think that's very important for people to realize, especially young artists who are the kind of dedication. You don't have to be in the center and the hubbub of everything. You can be more reflective about it. But we brought in this is you in Maine, and and then just to give you a sense of the. I guess the topoi, the subjects that you keep re returning to over the many years, as mm -hmm. I've been going through your right. records. Mm -hmm. uh, we have gardens, um, and here you are actually painting one of those fantastical um, cow, what is it called, the cow parsnip? It's a cow parsnip. Yeah, and, and uh, you don't always pick the most glamorous flowers, um, but there's, a, there's the flowers, there's another kind, there's the echinacea with the dive bomb. I think of it as the dive bomb bee coming right. in. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you have done figures. Action. You would do these um, these very weird um, Figure. figurative yeah. paintings where... The, those are from drawings. Now those, I went back to the early way of working and tried to make a painting from a drawing. But it's not like you had four naked people out of it. No, 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 it was one model. It's one model. And, and you, but it's, many very, poses, yeah. it's a very weird thing to do. Just put the four <laughs> <of them> back <laughs> into your garden on lawn piles. <laughs> and try to use another painting for the backdrop and kind of fit the thing together. But their bodies start looking like... They really remind us of the uh, Cezanne figurative paintings where they become kind of shapes that are yeah. like the logs right. combined right. into forms. And Were you thinking about that or just playing around? And I wasn't thinking about that, but I mean, you think about it, but not one to the no. paint. Yeah. And oh, that? really reminds those of you who go to the barns, <laughs> that yeah. bathers yeah. with the little figure in the background. That's, well, this, uh, this is from, we have a drawing group in the summer. It goes on, it's been going on for more than 20 years now. And the model is outside. And again, it's one of those beautiful things you can have because there's light and shadow on the body. And it's warm, the weather is good. They have a lovely garden and, and apple trees and other stuff where we, it's us, Susan and Tim Van Campen. They're both painters also. But anyway, they live in Thomaston. And, uh, so, from those drawings, I just thought, I'll try to do some figure painting. And speaking of friends, you did a lot of paintings of friends painting. Um, oh, right. There are tons yeah. of them over the years. Yeah, that was the same one person. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that. There's she, also, oh, I'm sorry, go on. She yeah. was coming to paint in Leslie's garden, painting the flowers. And uh, it took me years to decide I could stand to paint a flower because it seemed like a big mistake to start painting flowers if you're a woman painter. <laughs> you wind up, you know, being labeled a woman painter. So, uh, but anyway, my neighbor down the road, my friend uh, Nancy Wisman, she decided to paint in Leslie's garden. So I thought, well, okay, that's nice. It's a figure with this great big square rectangle and the barn and all. It should be interesting. So I began doing, she'd come every day to paint and I'd do another little painting of her painting. So and it's many of your concerns, like the geometry, yeah, seeing, seeing right. something geometric that interests you, right. a way to make a copy. I'm, yeah. One of the cool things that I've been doing is um, going through all of your cards from the many, many all the cards, yeah. paintings you've done. And for mm -hmm. every, every painting she finishes, you finish, 
you do a little card, title, medium, date, uh, whatever, and then and then there's a little in the lower left hand corner in every single one is a little sketch of the painting. Mm -hmm. And so what's cool about that is that apart from the fact that you did it all these years, which is incredible, is the fact that you can always recognize what painting it is because you really get the essence of the composition. It's clear that that's so to speak. Yeah. super important to you. You mm -hmm. know. Um, so what would be the, like if you were doing a sketch of this, what would you sketch the diagonal? Well, there was no sketch for this. There wasn't. No, it's just small. It's just a small. So no, I'm saying for, the, for the card. For the cards. For oh, every card, what would I do? a little. Oh, yeah. oh, that's easy. Just, you know, with the rectangle there and the barn shape there and the line across and maybe some little indication that there's a figure there and you recognize it then, you know? It's fascinating because it's yeah. that's the information about it. I mean that's really the that's what structures it. That's the information and then mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all the mm -hmm. passing things, the light and the color become these kind of ephemeral qualities that that really um, are the life and breath of the painting. So it's it's sort of interesting. So here's another she does quarries. What is that? <laughs> it's a quarry. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's sideways actually. Oh, sorry about that. That is not the first time I've made that mistake. Sorry about that. Yeah, it goes this way. Yeah. Yeah, but it's cool. It's like everybody turns their head. Mistake. Here is uh, laundry. You do a lot of images of laundry. That was about color. I was getting frustrated painting outside. Everything is green. <laughs> and I was craving red, so I thought I'll hang out the lawn, hang out some red cloth. So that's how that started. And then the laundry line is great because the stuff is flapping around and different shapes. So it got to be a thing. But it started with the looking for some red for color. This one's yellow, but there are red ones. Yeah, yeah lots of red, red ones, ones. Right. And, <laughs> and white. Right. And and yes. it's a huge, it's a huge theme for you. You do a lot of them. I know. Yeah. You do a lot. Of, <laughs> you do a lot of tunnels. Yeah, a lot of tunnels. Well, New Jersey is loaded with tunnels, Western New Jersey, and they all frame something, and they're all interesting. And uh, so I got into running around looking for tunnels. Good you get knocked out. And there. that was up in the park in the winter time. Uh, the, the federal park that runs along the Delaware River is very beautiful in the winter or any time of the year, but I would be more there in the winter. And uh, so I used to go there, you know, with friends and paint. You are you are the unquestionable master of any painter ever. I'm convinced of snow and whiteness. Snow and whiteness. And you do lots of different. I mean, I'm just giving you one. It's absurd. I mean, I could pick a thousand of these. These are yeah. these are incredible. Um, but these are. And the interesting thing too, Lois, is that you're not you're not into the panorama mostly. You, you no. like having a little no. section yeah. of a right. of a view. What's that yeah. about? I don't know what it's about, but I'm not interested in long views. Yeah. It doesn't. I just don't want to paint panoramas. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this, is about, this is about as far as you get. Yeah, that's yeah. as far as we go. But, but even so, you don't have the horizon. I mean, the horizon's not there. No, there's yeah. no horizon. Mm -hmm. they, they're right in your face. It's the water gap. And uh, the river was frozen and things were bobbling along. Very exciting stuff. So. And I think these are about as panoramic as you get are these images of the water gap, which is near right. your, your right. Blair's town home. Right. Yes. Yeah. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. There are lots of woods, of course. I think it's sort right. of an unusual one here. It's a swampy, a swampy, swampy view place. with yeah. green. I love that that um, chartreuse tree. Mm -hmm. Like you can feel the moss growing on it. Yeah. yeah. And then this is kind of a fun one because you have on the left Lois sitting in her studio with her little flashing paintings, and then which are little. And then you have on the right the biggest painting she ever made, which was is 14 feet high. And I had the great pleasure of seeing that recently in the collector's hall. Uh -huh. So, um, and you you had a hard time making that. You you had to keep. You explained that you had to do it in stages, yeah, it, it, right? It, yeah. 
But I didn't have the idea of doing that. It was not, it was not something that I planned. I just wanted to go in the woods and paint the house. The, the, the bottom third, if you can see where the division is, it's right. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I thought I'll, I'll, I'll have the house right at the top of the canvas. That'll be very interesting. It'll be the hanging to the top edge, just the rectangle of the front of the building. And uh, so I did that, and I liked it. And then I thought, gee, you know, I could do another painting with a, with a rectangle right at the bottom. That would be fun as a painting, and the trees going up beside it. But while I'm doing it, I'll make it fit on the first one. So those two fit together. And then when I got to the top of uh, that one, the trees were still going up. So, so, and I was about to have a show that was a Green Mountain Gallery. So I called up Lucian Day and said, how high is the ceiling? <laughs> and he said, he had one wall that was very, so I painted the third chunk. But you didn't do that again? No, I never did it again, no. And it wasn't that I planned it either. Mm -hmm. That's a good example of being responsive rather than yeah, yeah. premeditating a right. concept. Yeah, yeah. She also did, does a lot of facades. Of building, I like this one. I wanted to bring this one in because it's the window. Everything's so flat and closed off. There's no window opening up in it. Mm -hmm. Or derelict buildings. Mm -hmm. You like those, right? Well, and the thing is, you yeah. can paint there, and nobody bothers you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's derelict enough. I think that's probably why a lot of painters go to run-down, broken-down buildings. There's nobody around to get in your way. Although, on the other hand, there is a whole tradition of painting is sublime, that ruins are sublime, but I don't think that's what you do at all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're not into the sublime so much. Well, at least not, yeah. not obviously. And then, much to my amazement, a whole group of really lively, wonderful portraits that you've done. It's not what you're known for, but I think no. it's, yeah, you no. certainly did plenty yeah. of them. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of years there where I was asking this one and then that one to come and sit. Yeah. And uh, 1984. It's funny how you do things in chunks, you know. And then a couple of years later, kind of lost. Yeah, personal. there's no, there are no portraits anymore. Yeah. But I yeah. thought I think they're terrific portraits. Um, so now we're getting to the stuff of the show, and you know, one of the um, ways that windows are shown are, are sort of what we see through them. We're not so much aware of the window itself as right. what is seen through it. So. Yeah. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about where this is and what you see. All of these are out my window in New York, 2nd Street. And the first group on the right were done because, as I said, I, I used to make drawings and then I'd come back to the city and paint for my drawings every winter. But that year I decided I'd go on and paint directly outside and I didn't have any drawings. So when I got back to New York, I had nothing to work from. So I pulled myself over to the window, and well, let me try this. So then that became an ongoing project that just kept going over the years. And that was in 67, and I noticed 67. that, um, yeah. I noticed in your, in that amazing inventory of yours, which is like a, ready-made catalog resume that um, that 67 was a huge year for you actually I don't even know if you realize because I'm counting mm. everything now oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's this sudden exponential rise in the number of paintings you're doing in 66 uh -huh. 67 mm -hmm. so 67 suddenly you go from like 6 to 29 and then mm -hmm. from 29 to 45 mm -hmm. and then etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm assuming it's because you really were starting to work on Masonite yeah. And making a lot more. That's right, it. Right. Was there mm -hmm. any other reason yeah, why I mean, you... Mostly they're one-shot paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm out there painting the painting, and it's done. I can't go back the next day. I can't go back the next week. Because I feel like it's different. I'm different. The weather's different. It's, you can't go back. I can't go back. But if they're bigger, I can go back somehow. <laughs> 
you either plan more or something when it's a larger canvas. And well, the woods things I used to divide up into sections. I'd say, okay, I can paint between these two trees today and tomorrow, and then the next two trees. So if you look closely, you could probably see that the color changes, or some, there's there are clues there to, that it's not all done at one on one session. But uh, well, the particularity the of the time of day. I mean, that's what yeah. when I first started yeah. looking at your paintings, that's what really struck me was how particular, like, you know, you're looking at one of those little mace night games and you're in a certain time of day, in a right. place, yeah. you know, with certain kind of weather, right. or, you know, air and light, and that's right. it, and you, you get that, and that kind yeah, of sense of, and that's yeah. the part of that time thing of the sense of that it's going to pass, you mm -hmm. know, it's like mm -hmm. you, you, you lock it into place with your geometry, mm -hmm. but the feeling that it's going to somehow pass quickly is, mm -hmm. is there as well, so I think that combination is super fascinating. Even in a painting like this, mm -hmm. um, where it's pretty locked in in a lot of ways, but if you look up at that window in the that top pane, you see little splatters, and and you're aware that it might be raining out, you know, or that there could be some yeah. weather. Oh, maybe. Yeah. And that suddenly it becomes this. Yeah, no, I'm asking you. Yeah. And we went into the gallery, and I said, Lois, what did you do this? What's this? What's that arm stripe? What is it behind it? And she said. Oh, no, I can't really figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, once you're out of it, you're out of it. So. Right. That building across the way becomes a very important subject right. for you. It's the men's shelter for the city of New York. There's a lot of windows in the back. And it's, yeah, I used it quite a bit. I painted it quite a bit. Yeah. There's a funny sense of community to me always with those, that you're here and that that's alive on the other side of the night. And right. there's some kind of right. almost emotional link between between us and in this house and those that place over there, which I love the idea that it's a men's shelter and there's that sense of a, I mean, it's Hopper-esque and that you're, it's a lonely feeling, but there is a sense of connection there. Yeah. This crazy painting. Mm -hmm. That's nutty. Can you explain what that is? <laughs> oh, all right. I have a room in, in the house in Maine. And I decided I'd been painting in the woods across the road. And this room, the wallpaper was falling off, and I had to take it down, take the wallpaper off, damp from the winter, and patch plaster and so forth. And before I began to paint the room with a nice coat of paint, I looked at it and I thought, you know, why don't I take one of my painting paintings and I can paint on the wall. This will be my, my mural room. So <clears throat> I, I used the woods paintings as, a, as models and just used, I had some uh, cheap white wall paint, <clears throat> water base. And I also had some powdered pigment that was left over from my days at Cooper Union. So I mixed up the colors that I wanted as I went along and painted the wall. I painted the painting on the wall from these paintings I'd done across the road. And then, uh, a number of years later, I was painting windows, windows, I guess the windows completely. And uh, I thought, you know, I've been painting these windows. This looks really interesting. <laughs> this window with all this stuff on the wall. I think I'll make a painting of that. I think so, it's interesting. You give us the light bulb at I, the top I, to kind of I help us locate ourselves. You better put the light bulb in. That's the clue that you're in a room and you're not really out in the woods somewhere with a window hanging in the woods. It's that way too. It's yeah, yeah. it's too. I'm not a surrealist. No. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, you're definitely not a surrealist. No. So. For example? For, yeah. Yeah, this is about as... We should talk about it. You want me to hurry up? So okay. I, I, I actually wanted to put this, you know, we, we were just up in, at the 
Portland Museum is, yeah. is paintings. And That's right. So we yeah. never see figures in the paintings, even though they're reflective, in right. the windows rather, but in this yeah. one we do. That's right, yeah. And I asked you, why, why this one? Yeah. Because you're right, you. I probably could see myself in every one of them. Uh, I guess it looked like it could use something else. Something more could happen. That's a very Jasper Johnsian answer, I have to say. I mean, I had the trees there reflected, and the woodwork is showing that's uh, actually in the room, the white lines of the woodwork. But I don't know, because the, the flower was not the, the figure came before that yellow flower. Was the flower there, or did you the make flower? it up? No, it was there. And I thought, right. I want to push this window back a little bit. So I'll put this flower in front, you know, give it a little space. Well, there's a real camaraderie between that yellow and the figure. goldenrod and your yellow hat. Yeah, right, right, right. Which is this yeah. lovely, you know, you, you paint alone, you paint quietly by yourself, but then you have this sort of companion. Right, yeah. <laughs> And these are the windows from the show. Right. So we can kind of quickly move through those, uh, which you can enjoy more in person in the gallery. Do you want I to say anything paints, about these? The panes that look like little modernist paintings. You mean these? Yeah, yeah. again, this it one's definitely by Lee. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but it, yeah. It was, it was enough like that to, to uh, use it. And one thing that's great going into the gallery is you don't get from reproduction the kind of presence these have. And I understand that at a certain point you wanted to make them really life-size, like actual, right. the scale yeah. of an actual yeah. window, yeah. which is also kind of a, a little bit of a yeah. Trump Lloyd feeling. Yes. Yeah. But they do speak to you the way a figure would. They're the size that I am, many of them. Mm -hmm. And so they feel like another human presence, even though uh -huh. they aren't human. Do you feel that, or do you, why do you like the scale so much? Because it's trompe l'oeil, and I was thinking trompe l'oeil thoughts at the time, with all the windows, yeah. They all are sort of characters, aren't they? Yeah, I didn't want them to be small and far away from me. Yeah. yeah. A derelict window. Right, that was a derelict house. Here, here when we see through it, it's just that light, the white light at the other side. Sky. This one I was, I had this kind of revelation when I was looking at it in the gallery today because. The one on the left? The one yeah, the one on the left, the, yeah. the one with this, because it's, it's clearly a, almost a derelict house. The shutters are not in great shape. Yeah. The shade is torn. Right. And because the, of the rippling effect of the reflection, of the shadow rather, it's almost like it's moving a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it struck me so much as a kind of body toss, you know, in the sense, you know, the, oh, the mm -hmm. 17th century. Because on the one hand, you have um, something that you're observing that's alive, mm -hmm. but then you get the feeling that all life passes. You know, it's almost like it, it, it's an almost like it's an abandoner, mm -hmm. an aging thing. You know, and it's and, and I, I just thought, oh, it's a it's a body toss. Oh. Mm -hmm. That one. Oh, time. Okay. <laughs> and I can't tell you how much more we have here, so this is all the okay. show. Here, the feeling of a person with breath. I should, as, as these come up, I should just say, some of you may wonder, why are there landscapes in the show about windows and reflections? And um, do you want me to put that to you, or should I? <laughs> well, one thing I noticed is that, you know, when you look through a window, yeah. you see nature. Right. And we see nature reflected, and and when you paint paintings of nature, you often look to reflective surfaces. So that Blair Pond here is like a pane of glass, reflective of all nature around it, and it forms a sort of irregular, sometimes geometric, sometimes irregular aperture through which we can f understand the world as you see it framed. And when you discover something in nature, you identify a very striking viewpoint, and then you distill it in such a way that it's remarkable, so that the ordinary becomes extraordinary. And so I wanted to kind of eccentrically break the rubric of the show, because I think your paintings of windows then make us understand the landscape differently. And I wonder if when you're looking at 
say uh, the landscape like when you did natural order which is in the show mm -hmm. do you kind of think about the window a little bit the structure of a window or like I'm looking through the tree branches or is that just sort of not in your thoughts at all with the one on the left here what yeah suddenly that happened I thought, oh wow there's a religious painting and but it was happening in the water it was really so it was a matter of getting that down and that one was How did that happen? I, I drove up to my place in Maine, pulled up, it's June, early June, and that was going on in the back of the back shed. I thought, oh my God, you know, look what the apple tree is doing. You have to there are things that nature does that you somehow feel you have to pay some attention to and and uh, notice. I mean, if that apple tree doesn't want to be noticed, I don't know what, you know, what else you can say about it, you know? But also, you know, there's such a, I think there's such a truism out there that you're just, you know, painting what's there and you have a very down-to-earth kind of um, steady, sober view of what you see. And in fact, there are a lot of paintings by you that are really, I would put more in a visionary, almost a visionary um, level. And you said it was almost like a religious painting. Yeah. That there is yeah. this sense of, yeah, yeah. you know, yes, in, in, its, in its basics, it's, a, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's you know, what you, what you saw and the melting ice, but right. then something happens and it, and it transfixes it and, it and it creates something, as you said earlier, something timeless. And it's not fixed, as you say, they're transitory. It's something you can kind of call. Yeah. So, it's a nice so, so just quickly, right. just to... Okay. The bear, you know, well, no, I just wanted to put in, I just wanted you to see, because people don't know these paintings, these flashings, the step flashings, I think are almost all visionary. And they're often done at night. Yeah. But I think they are can you, really... Can you just say what the flashings are? Oh, sorry. Yeah. The flashings are the things that you buy in the, in the building supply store to flash your chimney with. They're little, little aluminum sheets, five by seven, sometimes six by eight, that's as large as they come, which, which carpenters use to put between the bricks and the roofing on the, on the roof. But they sell them in packets of 50 or 100, so, and they're very, very cheap. So you have this wonderful supply of stuff that with anything that happens, you can quickly try to get it down. Sometimes I feel like a reporter. Nature's doing this thing, I have to report it. You know, and if you have a small piece of something like that, you can put it down as fast as you can. One gets the sense of this almost, you know, liberatory, you know, that you can just put it down. If you don't like it, you can throw it well, away. Well, that's true, yeah. And, and it's just not going to be um, yeah. thought of it's as not a, yeah, it's premeditated, not a, right. important thing. Yeah. And I think you're just brilliant at it. Anyway, I just, I had to bring those in because I feel like people don't know them. And I think it's important to note that artists are often understood and kind of for one cross section of their work or gallery, commercial galleries <coughs> in particular, necessarily need to kind of identify a coherent, consistent body of work. But your practice, as with many great artists, is much more varied and experimental, going from very, very small to large. And there you are out in nature. On a rainy day, yeah. Anyway, True sorry part. to have raced through those. Well, yeah. well, we have just tried to cram a lot into this, Lois, and I know people in the audience are going to want to ask a few questions before we okay. have refreshments. But before we do that, I just wondered, is there something you wanted to share or add that we um, didn't get Not to? At the moment. I can't think of anything at the moment. Yeah. Okay. I, and, and I hope someday everybody has the pleasure of walking through campus with Lois who, you know, stops and makes you notice all the things along the way, the fallen leaves and um, that vision is something we could all use. Or driving to Philadelphia. Yeah. So, but, but so I have a, a microphone here. First I'd like to thank you, Lois, for your incredible art and I wonder if people could join me in just... So just so we can all hear each other, I wonder if anybody has a question and would mind my handing them the microphone so that everybody could hear. Then you can pass it to the next person. 
Um, hi, this is not a very profound question, but it did come up. Um, your paintings look like they're the ones in the gallery, especially all of them, look like they are so fresh and just so spontaneous. And yet, the way you talk about them, it feels like there are some revisions, like you were just talking about how the figure was not there originally in your little uh, yellow hat in that uh, one image from your, your garden. How much revision do you do? I um, mean, do you scrub out and take it back to the blank canvas? And Because every mark looks like it just flew off your brush yeah. and landed right where it should be. If there's any changing, it's usually right at the beginning. I mean, I'm usually drawing with maybe yellow or some ochre paint or something of that sort. And that's where any rubbing out would generally come in. Usually I'm not changing my mind after that point. Yeah. Um, I teach elementary art and I'm an artist. And I'm just curious, what kind of artist were you as a child? What kind of what? <laughs> what kind of artist were you as a child? When you were a kid. Yeah, what was it? Did you paint when you were artist? little? Were you an artist? Oh, oh, what was I an artist? No, I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> my sisters all used to sit around and draw, so I did that. And then the school system in Montclair, I have to say, it, they really had a lot of good art going on for kids. And the high school had a special art English course, which I took because I knew it would make high school more bearable. And then they had teachers who were in touch with, with the art schools in New York and they could tell us where to go check it out. And that's how, I mean, that's how I heard about Cooper Union. I never would, I wouldn't have had any idea that such a place existed except for these young art teachers that were, sat us all down and went over this stuff with us. It was very, it was very good program in the high school. So I was lucky. Lois, can you talk about a time when you feel that you weren't taken as seriously or given as many opportunities because you were a woman in this field and how you responded to that? Um, she wants to know, as a woman, did you ever feel like there were times you weren't being taken seriously and how you responded well, most to Most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> how do you respond? You just keep working. But, you know. But a lot of men weren't taken, a lot of people weren't taken seriously, so it's not totally just women. And you were also a lot a of artists aren't taken seriously. That's <laughs> right. You were also a figurative artist at a time when that wasn't fashionable. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. All the art, the art that was really exciting at the time was the abstract expressions. They were, they were, really, you know, vital and all around where we had our gallery, where the studios of people like De Kooning and Franz Klein and. Rothko and they'd be drifting around the streets to work off. And uh, so it, it was very exciting. We, you know, I, what I was doing was not in the middle of that. But they were, those people were supportive. You know, artists are artists. They kind of, it was, it was a good place and time. And Leonard was the first real realist that we showed. And, and also that was well-received, too. Very well-received. Also, your earliest work, yeah. which we didn't show any of today, really has an abstract expressionist feel to it, even though there are cows or right, you know, representations of animals. Many people couldn't make out the cows. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They looked like cows to me, but anyway. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I hope you'll join me in applauding Lois once again. So